with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Psalm 95, uh, verse 6 through 7 reads, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand.
For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return while suffering. He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judge, judges righteously, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed.
You did set us free. Thank you, God, for uh, just um, just the, the precious gift of your Son Jesus Christ. We thank you for um, just your your sacrifice for us, Father. And um, we we just lift up the rest of this time of worship um, as Ted speaks. God, we pray that uh, you would speak directly to us through him. Change our hearts, God. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right, as the kids are leaving, I have a couple of announcements. Um, we are looking for volunteers to help cook meals on Wednesday nights. So if this is something you're interested in, there's a sign-up sheet on the kitchen door, or you can talk to Liz Gibson to get some more information. Um, last Sunday, we got to hear from Reese Frechette uh, share about his upcoming opportunity uh, with YWAM at the Discipleship Training School. And next Sunday, uh, we are going to have a bake sale. He's going to be baking ferociously all week some delicious goods uh, just to help him raise the funds that he needs uh, to go to that school. So that'll be next Sunday. Make sure you come a little bit hungry for that. Um, and also a reminder that this Wednesday night, Daryl and Jody Winger will be sharing about their ministry with international students here. So, yeah, woohoo, I like it. <laughs> um, so, be sure to come listen to uh, Daryl and, and Jody this Wednesday um, as they share. And now I get to introduce uh, some special guests guests, although they're not really guests. They're definitely part of our Mac family. Many of you remember Nathan and Christina Hammerberg, who, um, yeah, love the cheering section in the back. That's awesome. Um, they, they attended Mac for a while, and for about the past year and a half, they've been out um, raising support and preparing for the call that God has placed on their heart to go to the Middle East. And so they're hopefully going to be heading out by the end of this year, but they are here today, and they are going to share about what they've got going on and what they're doing. We're going to watch a, a video that they've put together first and then they're going to come up and share. Especially in the 
the Islamic world, people need legitimate encou love encounters. They need something that's deeper than theology. They're, they're covering theology right now. They don't need more. They don't need more rules. They need love. They need love that goes, goes deeper than what the, anything they've experienced. And, and you want to just get... Especially in the, the Islamic world, people need legitimate encou love encounters. They need something that's deeper than theology. They're, they're covering theology right now. They don't need more. They don't need more rules. They need love. They need love that goes, goes deeper than what the, anything they've experienced. And, and you want to just get out where the people are. You want to get integrated in your community. You want to get in a taxi cab and just start up a conversation with the guy driving. And he's going to ask why you're there and what you're doing. And those are awesome opportunities to share Christ. Hi, we're the Hammerbergs and we're headed to an area called the 1040 window. The 1040 window is an area of the world that most people aren't even aware of. It's um, the stands, China, India, um, the Arabian Peninsula, Northern Africa. Uh, the majority of people in the, uh, the population of the world live there. 95% of unreached people groups live there. Unreached meaning um, they have no access to the gospel, they've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. More disheartening though, only 10% of missionaries go to the 1040 window. In that part of the world right now, there is a hunger that has not been seen probably since Christ walked the earth. The stories that are coming in on a daily basis of people that are reaching out and just flat out beating the door down to find out who Jesus is, it's unbelievable. I mean, thousands of people are coming to Christ right now. We believe we're on the verge of one of the biggest church planting movements we've seen in a long, long time. And it's, it's exciting to be a part of that. I mean, we are, we're pumped. Uh, we, can't wait to, we can't wait to get out there. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, we, we're ready to go. More than anything, we just need people to come with us. Like, we cannot do this without, uh, without you. <laughs> we can't do it without people remembering us and praying for us and cheering us on and saying, yes, we're with you, we get it, and we want to see um, one of the darkest places on the planet come to know Christ, Like, and we're, we're with you. And the cool thing is, it's not about us, it's about what God can do and what the Holy Spirit can do through us, and He always shows up, He always delivers, because it's His heart that none should perish. And people are perishing, and so like, He's always going to show up to save his children, always. And we're just, we're just the mouthpieces. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys again. Um, We've been out on the road for a while now, and it just feels good to walk into somewhere where you have such good memories. I mean, we were here for like four years, and I remember the first time we walk in and saw that map on the wall and smelled that coffee, you know. If, if you weren't aware, uh, MAC stands for Muncie's Awesome Coffee, so <laughs> now you know that. But um, yeah, we're just, it's a real privilege to be with you guys this morning and share about what we're doing. And, very interesting part of the world. You know, you saw that video, you saw saw where we're headed. We're headed to actually Cairo, Egypt, within the Middle East there. And a lot of you watch the news, you know, you see you see what's going on and you're probably thinking in your head, maybe now isn't the best time for something like that. But let me give you the rest of the story here, okay? Historically, when there's violence like there is right now and there's uprisings and governments being overthrown, it creates an openness and it creates a, a real searching in the hearts of people. And they really look back on the religion and they look back at what their leaders are saying and say like, what the heck are we doing? I mean, this is, it's very, it causes a lot of conflict in the heart 
when you're going through something like that. So in reality, we have never seen in history an openness and a hunger like there is right now. And that's why right now is so important. That's why we're working so hard to get there. That's why we're joining a team of over 40 people that are already there doing it, getting ready to go out into places that have literally never had a single church. So Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we've really taken the all part quite literally. Um, there are over 6,000 unreached people groups in the 1040 window and other places in the world. But um, they literally have no access to the gospel whatsoever. There's no Christians. There's no missionaries. There's no uh, bookstore down at the corner. A lot of websites are blocked. They can't search like that. So we're going to be a light in a dark place. And, you know, darkness is basically just absence of light. And that's what we're going to be. We're going to be that light. We're going to give them access. We're going to show the heart of Christ to people that have um, literally never encountered a believer before. So there is a massive harvest out there, really big. And the workers are, the workers are going. They're few, but we're, we're gaining in number. We're gaining in momentum. Uh, the Lord is empowering his people. He's pouring his spirit upon his workers, equipping them to go out and really giving them what, the, what it takes. So we see statistics, you know, we see numbers, but God isn't intimidated by any of that. He's powerful, he's strong, and he's moving amongst his people. Yeah. Um, hi. There, we'll do that. We'll do that. Um, yeah, actually, like he said, uh, the main message we want to convey to you is that um, the news is, is not the full story uh, that you get to see. Uh, we have the privilege, um, because we have good friends and acquaintances already over there, to hear the cool parts, <laughs> the things that are happening um, on a regular basis. And actually what inspired us was um, two very cool stories uh, when we first started this journey. Um, all my life I've been told uh, it takes about six years for just one Muslim to come to Christ. And growing up that was an intimidating statistic. Um, however, uh, so we have some acquaintances. We'll call um, for safe, safety reasons. His name is Ted. Um, he was working in Jordan and with him and his wife. And this was about, I don't know, two and a half years ago, I think. Um, they began making friends with a man named, of course, Muhammad. And uh, Muhammad, you know, just through relationship and Nate being a good neighbor, they just began talking. Um, Jesus loves parables, so do missionaries. Uh, so uh, Ted just started telling parables from the Bible. Started telling, you know, the stories that you would hear in Sunday school. Noah, you know, that's a fun story. Uh, <laughs> and Muhammad, because they don't really have Netflix uh, or Hulu, Muhammad would go back to his large family and tell these stories. Um, he didn't make the connection that this was a Bible, biblical thing. And after Ted started kind of running out of stories, Muhammad's like, hey man, my family's kind of getting bored, needs more stories. And, uh, you know, Ted took the opportunity to say, well actually, let me introduce you to the living God, you know. And uh, through that, through Muhammad, who's now named Noah, uh, 2,000 Muslims have come to Christ in just two years. And that's not, all, that's not just, that's like one sector. I've heard other, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. Um, so, you know, we, we get to be a part of that, you know. Um, another really cool story that really encouraged us is through our organization that we're going, it's, uh, you know, it's a bunch of denominations that have gotten together and said, hey, let's be the bride of Christ and actually do this together. Um, they have planted a church in the country of Oman. This hasn't had a, a known believer in, well, Pretty much since Jesus walked the earth, you know, like 2,000 years, yeah. So uh, 
we'll call this missionary Dan. Dan had set up a for-profit for school, English grammar, and all of these um, Muslims had gathered to learn English. He was teaching grammar one day, everybody's favorite subject. I'm an English teacher, everybody's favorite subject. Uh, and um, all of a sudden, one of the, the, the guys in the class stood up in front of the Islamist leaders and said, we don't want to be Muslim anymore. Can you tell us about Christ? Tell us about Jesus. And I mean, just because Dan is white, I think they assumed, okay, yeah, he's a Christian. Um, so through that, there's been a movement in that village. It's just, um, it's it's awesome. That's, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, so the reason that we, you know, I grew up in a non-Christian home, and do you guys remember the 2004 tsunami? It, it kind of was like what happened just recently in the Philippines, but in Sri Lanka and in that part of Southeast Asia. Um, it wiped out tens of thousands of people. And I remember as a younger woman uh, looking at the images on the screen and I became overwhelmed. Um, I started seeing all the devastation. Um, 10,000 people, like, in an instant dead. Uh, and I actually started to just cry. And so for three days straight, I cried, like, just bawled. And my mom, who was not a Christian at the time, uh, she just didn't know what to do with me. She had no idea why her daughter would be cr crying over people I've never met. Uh, what God revealed was that these people died and they didn't know they didn't know him and uh, that that it it wiped me out um, and I committed my time I said oh my gosh I have to do something I found out most people in that area of the world like the 1040 window don't have the opportunity to even know about Christ and um, so it just made sense to me I'm like well it doesn't matter where I go I want to go where they don't know, and it just, how could I not? So that is why I have committed my life to this, and on the, the way, I've met him, and Mac has been our, our home. Um, so, we will be joining a team in Cairo, Egypt, through an organization called Live Dead. Uh, like he said, there's lots of people waiting for us. We actually have a team waiting. Um, we will be learning Arabic <laughs> for four hours a day, every day, and then uh, potentially either teaching English or um, he works in sustainable agriculture. So however we can. We are not ordained. We are just people that have gifts and are crazy in love with Jesus and are just you know crazy enough to say, why not? Why not? Um, so after our three years in Egypt, we hope to uh, lead a team potentially to an unreached people group. Uh, so we'll be in the Middle East as long as God lets us. Um, we've actually already sold everything, um, except for the, you know, really important stuff we've kept, like camping gear and, uh, yeah, yeah, his stuff, <laughs> fishing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so we are, we're actually, we're ready to go. And one of our biggest uh, passions is actually doing exactly what we're doing now is just meeting with people, um, exposing this part of the world, hearing your hearts. Um, we would love to pray with you if maybe your heart's getting stirred, like, why not me? You know, w please, we'd love to meet with you. Um, we'll be in the back. Um, but. Honestly, like the video said, we, we can't go without you. Um, we, need, we need monthly partners, but we also need people to remember us. Um, we need people to pray for us and people to Skype with us and <laughs> people to email us. So we would love to just talk to you. Um, we'll ha be in the you know, coffee area. And if you are interested in getting updates, we'd love for you to write your email down. And um, we, d we love staying in contact with people. Um, you're our gateway back, you know? You're our team. So, uh, yeah, so please feel free to come and meet us in the back um, and let us pray for you too. Uh, thank you so much for letting us be here. We're, we're just really, really glad to be here. We get to say goodbye to the Pritchards. This is their last weekend. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much. We really appreciate it.
I do want you to prayerfully consider how you might support the Hammerbergs, uh, how you might get involved in reaching... I'm going to try to untangle this. How you might partner uh, with them. We've kind of been doing a missions emphasis here, not necessarily intentional, but God has a way of showing up and doing things He wants to do uh, these last few weeks. As yesterday or as last week, we the sermon really zeroed in on our role uh, in reaching the lost, and then uh, uh, getting to hear what incredible things God is doing uh, in the Middle East in the 1040 window. That unreachable or unreached, not unreachable, unreached uh, people groups, and uh, and then Reese is going to be be heading off to YWAM, and in a couple weeks we're going to be uh, or next week we'll be taking up uh, an offering for the Great Commission. Mission Fund. So missions is right there in front of us. And uh, it, it can be a scary thing sometimes, or it can be an incredibly exciting thing uh, with what God does and how God, how God moves. And just a little update on where we are at. I mentioned last week that we'd put an offer on a house. Um, they countered. We accepted the counter. And uh, we are looking to be moving in th- how many days? 26 days. <laughs> Mackenzie has it all down. Uh, down in that, we're uh, looking at a house in Evergreen West. I guess it's that direction, isn't it? I get all turned around. But uh, that's kind of an exciting and scary thing uh, as well. Uh, as, we, as we have driven through the neighborhood, we're, we're looking at neighbors. We're looking at neighbors' houses and thinking those are the people God is placing us in the midst of to reach. Uh, Those are the people that God wants us to reach right here at the end of these fingertips. And as we've gone through this whole buying process, you know the whole inspection deal and and our realtor jumped right on it. We had the pest inspection. There's no little bugs living anywhere that we could see. Um, And then Thursday we had the whole house inspection and it it passed, not with flying colors, but it passed. And we're not not scared. But there's there's a lot of of items discussed in that house inspection and they all kind of dealt with security, safety. You know, is the furnace safe? You know, is there a gas leak? Is there a water leak? Uh, are there smoke alarms? Uh, you know, the garage door was not working. Well, that's kind of a security issue. You'd kind of like to know that the garage door is going to close and stay closed um, with that. And, and uh, smoke alarms throughout. And we, we even talked about changing the locks on the house since it was a rental. And who knows who all has a key to uh, what will be our new house. Um, and uh, so... so we kind of, as we were looking at that, realizing we kind of live in a, in a security-crazed society. Uh, we live in a, in a society that's kind of motivated in a lot of areas by fear. We want economic security. We want job security. We want national security. Some people uh, sign prenup, prenup agreements for marital security. Never quite understood that one. After 9-11, the talk was on national security, homeland security, and the need to to secure our borders. We want to create a a safety place. We we buy security systems for our houses. We build high fences. We have guard dogs. It was interesting when I went and checked on on, uh, homeowner's insurance. One of the questions they asked is, do you have a dog? I said, yes, we do. And they said, is it a guard dog? Or is it, has it ever been trained to be a guard dog? And I said, no, it hasn't. It hasn't been trained to do anything. <laughs> and, and they said, well, good. That actually works in your favor. Okay, so understand this. From an insurance standpoint, not having a guard dog works in your favor. You know why? Guard dogs bite. If that guard dog trained to bite bites someone, your homeowner's insurance doesn't like that. We live in a, in a safety crazed, a security crazed uh, society. Uh, we, get, we get flu shots to secure not getting the flu. I've known people who's got, gotten the flu shots and then got the flu from the shot. So trying to be safe, we actually brought harm to ourselves. But even with all of this security, there is no guarantee that your house won't get broken into. There's no guarantee that your car won't get broken into. I've had mine broken into twice. 
There's no security that you won't get the flu. So we live with hope. We hope that the alarm system works. We hope that the fence is high enough. We hope that the flu shot keeps us from getting the flu. But is that enough to just hope that we are right? Hope is a crazy word. Hope is a future word. Hope is always looking to the future. Hope, we, hope, as I looked up the definition, says it's a feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. It's a feeling that what is wanted can be had or it's a feeling that events will turn out for the best. It's a hope. It's a person or thing in which expectations are centered. It's to look forward to with desire and reasonable confidence. Now, what's reasonable? Some people say, I'll take a 50-50 chance. That's reasonable enough for me. Someone else says, no, nah, I want 90% I want chance this is going to happen. What's reasonable? Hope is kind of a nebulous thing out there. <clears throat> hope is a wish. I, I hope it doesn't rain today. Well, if we look outside, there's a reasonable chance that it's not going to. Hope can be an expectation. It says, I'm late and there's never a police officer on this stretch of road. I hope he's not here today. Hope also brings uncertainty. There's always the possibility that it won't happen. We, we have the phrase, we hope against hope. That means that we continue to hope, although the outlook does not warrant hope. But we hope against hope. Hope never guarantees an outcome. Wishing hard enough doesn't make something happen. I, I really hope it doesn't rain, but it's cloudy and there's a 75% chance of rain. Am I hoping against hope? I hope the Cubs win. Where's Neil? There we go. But given the last four years, I looked this up, there's a 70% chance they won't. <laughs> they have a 70% or their, their winning percentage is only 30% over the last four years. The last time they actually had a winning record. That's why sometimes the, the, the idea of faith is hard to understand because faith is so closely connected to hope. In even the biblical definition, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, the writer says, faith is being sure of what is hoped for and certain of what we do not see. Now when you go back and look at the definition of hope, there's a lot of feeling, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's, there, there's, there's no guarantee, but faith is being certain of what we hope for. Which makes me wonder, what's the difference? What's the difference between a biblical hope and society's understanding of hope? The, 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 the secular definition of hope. And it all boils down to the question is what we attach our hope to. If men would sit and think, they would probably have to admit that at some level, on some level, they want a sense of security about the future, about death, about what's going to happen when this life is over. That if we're truly honest with ourselves, we want some sort of hope in what lies next. The security of heaven, the security that nothing exists after death or, or that we get reincarnated. There's all kinds of philosophies out there that people are banking their hope on, that they're standing on in hope that this is what's going to happen. Last week we discussed that, that all men have a sense of God, his, his nature and power through creation, that, that God gave us all a conscience uh, to give us a sense of right and wrong and that, that right should be rewarded and wrong should be punished. That's just kind of an innate uh, within us. So men have divined countless philosophies that are going to give us a sense of hope in the face of death. That we can find security in the hope that they've been good enough. You ask most people, do you believe in heaven or hell? Do you believe in heaven? Yes. Do you think you're going to go there? 
I hope so. That's usually the response. I hope so. Well, what do you think? Why do you think you'll go to heaven? Well, I hope I've been good enough. I think I've been good enough. Or some will say, I, I couldn't believe that God won't send good people to heaven. That, that, that God is too loving. He, he'll never send a, a good person to hell. And, and people find security in the hope that God is, is, is so loving. Or they, they just wipe hell out altogether. They say hell doesn't exist. I hope it doesn't exist. That's what most people would think. They find security in the hope that, that death is not final and that we're going to come back in another life with another chance. Some people find security in the hope that, that death is final and it doesn't matter how we live here because when we die, we're gone. It's over. It's done. Nothing else. From a biblical understanding, however, hope can be certain. And so when we contemplate eternity, when we contemplate the, what happens after we die, there needs to be a level of certainty in it. We need to know that this is what's going to happen. We need to know, not just, not just hope for hope's sake, but we are certain in what we hope for. Buying our house, one of the selling points, not selling point to us, but one of the things they listed as a selling point, were smoke alarms. There were smoke alarms all over the house. You know what we found out in the inspection? None of them work. <laughs> Batteries are all dead. So if we moved in and we put all of our hope and safety and security in the fact that there are smoke alarms not thinking whether they work or not. So if we put all of our hope and security in what we think life after death is going to be like, but there's no validity to it. There's no power in it. We're all guilty of sin before God. We, we've learned that over the last three or four weeks. There's not a person born that's not guilty before God and that he is just in judging us. And man has devised countless ways to avoid or deny or deal with this coming judgment. This morning we want to take a look at Israel. We want to take a look as Paul outlines what was happening to the Jews and discover their own false hope. Their own false security in the future. What they were putting their hope in. And then begin to discover and unpack what is certain that you can put your hope in. So that we can walk out of here safe. So that we can walk out of here secure in what we know the future holds. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 2. I want to read Romans chapter 2 starting with verse 17 because Paul is going to, kind of, and we entitled the sermon Hope Foe or Hope Full. Uh, hope Foe is not a word. I made it up. At least spell check didn't like it. But it's false hope. It's fake hope. It's not anything that you can be certain about. And yet Israel was banking on this being true. And then we're going to look at what God says is true true, what we can be hopeful about. So Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then... Who teach, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's a harsh statement. 
circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. What advantage then is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar as it is written so that you may be proved right in your words and prevail in your judging. But if your unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If there were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? Their condemnation is deserved. Paul says the, the world has mixed things up. They've gotten things wrong. The Jews had things wrong. The Gentiles had things wrong. He said, we're placing hope in things where there is no hope. And we're not leaning on the things that are certain, that are secure, that are, are steadfast, that we can lean upon. Paul lists three things that the Jews were holding tight to. That said, when, when life was over, this is what's going to save me. This is what's going to make me right before God. And the first one they said in verse 17 is the fact that they were called a Jew. Their own heritage. They were counting on the fact that they were a Jew and that's all they needed. That was all that was important. They placed their hope on the fact that they were a Jew. They took pride in being a Jew. Now they were also known as Israelites. That was their national nationality. They were from Israel. In the Old Testament we also know them to be Hebrews. They were also known as Hebrews because that was their language. They spoke Hebrew. And, and in Jesus' time in the New Testament they were strictly known as Jews because that was their religion. That was their, their, their sacred name, Jew. And they took pride in that name. Jew came from the tribe of Judah, one of the twelve tribes. And the name of the southern kingdom after Solomon was king and the kingdom was split between a north, northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The tribe of Judah made up the southern kingdom. And it was from this tribe of Judah that the Messiah, oftentimes called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, was to come. And so being a Jew carried with it in their own mind honor, prestige, security with God. It was their hope. It was their false sense of security that, that came in who they thought they were. They were descendants of Abraham. They were descendants of Isaac. They were descendants of Jacob. And that meant they were right with God because of who they were. Because of whose son or daughter they were. Because of their lineage, which is why genealogy was so important to them. To know which tribe they were from. And they made it a point to say that they were, that they followed after the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Because you know, Muslims also follow the God of Abraham but the God of Ishmael and the God of Muhammad. That both religions, whether they be from Islam or Christianity or Jews, all three go back to Abraham. But it's after Abraham that things get a little squirrely. But the Jews held on to that heritage. The Jews held on to the significance that they were a Jew. And that was what was going to save them in the end. So they put an overemphasis on heritage. They also found a false hope in their knowledge. Verse 18 says, If you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law. If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, an instructor, a teacher, they had the embodiment of knowledge and truth. 
You see, for the Jew, their safety and security came in the fact that Moses was given the law. The Jews were given the law of God. They were taught the law as children and, and they knew what the law required. Now we have to understand that when they said law, they meant the first five books of the Old Testament. What's called the Pentateuch. Those are the books of Moses. But it also included the Psalms, the Proverbs, and the Prophets. They had the complete set. And the Jews had access to the complete set. And only the Jews had access to the complete set. They were God's chosen people. Chosen to be given the law. And this many times added to their sense of superiority over other people. Because God chose to reveal the law to them only. What they failed to understand is what we learned last week is that God wrote that law on everyone's heart. And the reason why he had to give it to the Jews, they weren't listening to their heart. God said, all right, let me spell it out for you. The problem was they had it, but they didn't obey it. And no one could obey it perfectly. And so they had the hope in the fact that they were a Jew, the hope in the fact that they had the law. But Paul's saying none of that mattered. None of that was good enough. And then they held on to their traditions. Circumcision being the main one. Circumcision is what set the Jew apart from all other people on the, in the world. And if you remember the story of, of when, when Abraham was given the covenant with God, and he began to, to follow after God. And God had placed his call upon Abraham and was going to bless him with land, bless him with people. He was going to be a, a promise uh, to, the, to, the, to the nations. And God said, here's, here's what we're going to do to seal the deal, Abraham. You're going to circumcise every male in the nation of Israel. And Abraham's like, wait a minute. Now when you're eight days old, you don't remember it. Abraham was not eight days old. He was going to remember this. He was going to remember what was about to happen to him. And then he also had to convince the entire nation that this was a good idea. And they all did it. They all followed him. It was a huge step of faith because... It's, I mean, they, they, that's going to take a guy out of service, out of life. It's going to put him on the couch for two, three, four, five, six days. It's going to take the entire army of Israel out of commission for possibly weeks. Can you see now the step of faith that that required? Certain that God had called him to do that? Because you've just left your entire nation wide open for attack. Because the men could not fight back. And so they put this emphasis on circumcision and the Jew over the years put an un, uh, uncertain hope that because they were circumcised, because they had the law, and because they were Jew, nothing else mattered. It was good. Now, we have some of the same issues in the church today. For some, being a Christian, just that word is all I need. Do you think you'll go to heaven? I'm a Christian. I live in a Christian nation. Do you know that word Christian has become so watered down today. It doesn't really mean anything anymore. It didn't mean anything more than, it actually it meant less than being called a Jew back in those days. It's not really a good identifier. But many hold on to it. And I know in the, in the Middle East, there's, there's, you know, we talked about in Jewish times, there were, or in, in Bible times, there were Jews and Gentiles. Those were the two types of people. In the Middle East, for most, there's Muslim and Christian. That's the only two. If you're not a Muslim, then you must be a Christian. Is that true? No. You see, we have broadened the definition of Christian to include almost anyone. Do we hold on to that name a little too tightly? And that our hope is in the name Christian? Do we hold on to the fact that we have this? 
I have a Bible. I've got about 20 Bibles. And I have a countless number on my iPad translations of this Bible. But the Jew forgot there was a responsibility that came with knowing the Word, with having been given the Word. Is that we had to know it and we had to live by it. <clears throat> and it wasn't enough to say, well, I, I teach it. Okay. So, do you live by it? Has it changed your life? Has it, has it transformed who you are? The message that it contains. Because the Jew is all about having it on the shelf, in the living room, where everyone could see it. But it didn't change who they were. And, and we have our own traditions in the church. Now, hang with me on this one. Traditions are not bad unless they replace the hope that we have in Christ. Because we have two traditions, and, and circumcision was not bad. I mean, God instructed, God gave that to them. We have baptism. Jesus instituted the baptism, and baptism is important. Baptism is, a, is that outward sign of an inward change, is how I refer to it. That it is that public confession. It's that stepping out and saying, I'm being baptized because I am dying with Christ. I am living with Christ. From this point onward, I'm a new creation. I'm a different person. But the act of baptism, the act of getting all wet, does not save you. There's no hope for salvation in the act of baptism. Baptism is the act that proves that salvation has already been granted. It's that outward expression of what has been going on in the inside. But how many people put the fact that they were baptized once as their hope for what's going to happen after they die? They've put their hope in the tradition, in that outward sign. Well, God says it's got to be an inward change. We can do it with communion. Communion is another thing that, that God gave us, that, that instituted with, with us that, that we would remember what Christ did on the cross. That we would commune together with one another and with God in remembering the salvation that is ours. Now some would go so far as to believe that the act of taking communion brings salvation. I attended a church once, in fact grew up in the church, that if you died on Wednesday and you didn't take communion on Sunday, it's a crapshoot. You have 50-50 chance whether you're going to make it. Because for them, communion on a weekly basis was what kept you in a right standing with God. They put their hope in the act of communion. Baptism and communion are important, but they can be traditions, they can be, be, be ordinances that we put too highly in for our hope. Do you have a false hope this morning? When dealing with the question of eternity, where is your hope? Is it the fact that you were born into a Christian family? That you went to church all your life? I've heard testimonies where, you know, where, I, where I've asked the person, I said, you know, tell me about your, your journey with God. When, when, did you, when did God mean something more to you than just a word or a deity out there? And he says, well, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. You have not always been a Christian. You've always been a sinner, separated from God. But there was a process. And for some people, there was a point in time. But for every one of us, there was, a, there was a process where we came to understand my own depravity and God's own righteousness and God's fulfilling of the payment through Christ and that we, by faith, accepted that you've not always been a Christian. I'll just get it straight right now. I was raised in the church. Well, good. I've been baptized. Great. But where do you gain your right standing? Where do you gain your hope of salvation before God? Because it's not in any of those things. 
So what hope do we have? Paul anticipated three questions that they were going to be answering, asking in, in chapter 3. And he said, so if we have all these things in chapter 1, he says, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, if we have all these things, if we have the tradition, if we have the law, if we have, if we have the heritage, then, then what good is it all to have all those things? What advantage comes with being God's people? Paul says, you see, our hope is not in who we are, but our hope is in whose we are. It's not in my ability. It's not in my life. I, I, I have a hopeless life without Christ. That all of my hope is not in the heritage of, of who I am, but whose I am. I am God's. And there is true hope in being God's people, in being God's chosen, in being God's called. But we have to not lose sight of what it means to be a child of God. The Jew would ask if being a, of Jewish heritage or knowing the law or being circumcised, and circumcised does not make us righteous, then what good is it? But the Jews had lost sight of the fact that they were the first to be chosen. They were the ones that God was going to work through, that God was going to change, that God was going to change the world through. And somewhere along the line, they, they rejected the relationship with God. They made it all about themselves. They lost sight of what it meant to be a Jew. And we can sometimes lose sight of what it means to be a Christian. And we make that relationship all about ourselves. That we lose sight that there's a responsibility that God's called us out for a purpose. And that purpose is not to make me happy or comfortable. That purpose is to reach the lost, to shed the light into dark places. It's to transform a world. It's to bring back the image of God and the people in which he created. And our advantage is that we go in the name of God. That God goes before us. And when the Jews rejected it, God said, I'm opening it up to the whole world. Hallelujah, or none of us would be here. That the Gentile world now has the possibility of a true hope. And our hope is God desires to be in relationship with us. That he desires to forgive us. That he desires to empower us. That he desires to heal us. That he desires to pour out his blessing on his people. Knowing God is a great advantage in this life. God has called you. If you are a follower of God, if you go by the name Christian, and that's a true name, God has called you. He has selected you. He has entrusted with His body, He has entrusted His body with His Word. We've been given the keys to life. We've been given the, the message, and, and Paul says, I'm unashamed of that message because it is the power for salvation of everyone. And it is through that message that we know Him. That we get to know him better. That we love him. That we get to love him better. Church, you are a selected people. You know you've been, you now have been entrusted with the very words of God. Entrusted with the message of forgiveness. The power of salvation. That we can be certain of what we hope for. Because it comes from God, not from man. Peter writes in his first, what we call his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, says, but you are a chosen race, your heritage. You're a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And in receiving mercy, we've received hope. Hope that is certain. Hope that we can live on, that we can bank on, that we can, we can put everything on. The Jews focused their attention on the privilege. And they ignored the responsibility. They focused on, on many man-made traditions and replaced her love for God and His Word. Our hope comes in a relationship with God. And that relationship is, is enhanced. It grows as we take seriously the responsibility of knowing Him. Of knowing and sharing His Word. 
And the Jews would question, well, does all of this nullify God's promises then? All the promises that God laid out, does, does our being sinful nullify those? He says in verse 3, he says, what if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? So if God's going to save Israel, if God's going to save mankind, does, does people not having faith nullify God's promise to save? Not at all. God's promise to Israel was not to a Jew because they were Jewish, but because they had had faith. His promises are always to the faithful. Many Jews lived, lived as if they had faith in being a Jew rather than faith in God. They put their faith in the wrong thing. The promise is that through confession, ad admitting my sinful state before God, repenting, turning from sin, and turning toward God, having that personal faith and believing that God forgives and then resulting in a life of faith, in obedience to God, that is what God is after. God promises, reveals in His Word, are, are, are many times conditional. God's promises are, are a result of faithful obedience. A lot of times God will say, if then... If you follow after me, then I will. There are consequences, good consequences of following him. You see, I can be certain that God is going to be faithful. I can be certain that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That even if I'm going through a dark, dark period in my life, I can know with certainty that God is there and going to see me through. I don't know the outcome. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. But I know it's going to work for good. It's going to work for God's purpose. It's going to be used by Him. And I can with certainty live my life in light that everything is going to work towards the goodness of God. And then they ask the crazy question. If our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, isn't that a good thing? If my sinfulness stands in such stark contrast to God's holiness, isn't that a good thing? That I am more sinful so that God looks more holy? That's where he says, I, I've got this human argument going on that, that really doesn't make sense. Because they were saying, well, then isn't it good for us to be sinful? Because, and he even brings it up in Romans chapter 6, the more I sin, the more grace I get. So should we not sin more so that grace abounds? And what does Paul say? By no means. No. That our hope is, is, is not in sinfulness. It's the thinking that God's people can continue to sin because it enhances God's righteousness and, and his willingness to forgive. But Paul says, no. Live in the truth that he has changed you, that he has transformed you, and let your living, your righteousness that comes through Christ be a stark contrast to the rest of the world. Let your life stand as an example to the righteousness of God, not to the sinfulness of man. So that other men stuck in their own sin and trapped captive, bound in their own sin, will see that there is hope. Because this person certainly is different. This person lives on another plane. This person lives with another end in mind. One of our great abilities is to rationalize our own sin. To make the end justify the means. Well, it all worked out in the end, so the sin wasn't that bad. God covers a multitude of stupid. God can work through our stupidness. He can work through our sinfulness, but he desires to work his holiness through us. Paul is saying, no, God has a higher way to live. Sinning doesn't glorify God. Obedience, proving the ability to overcome the fallen nature, glorifies God. Proves His power. So this morning we need to draw that there is hope in following after God. 
that there is hope in eternity because of God's promises. God's promises are not null and void because of our sinfulness. The promises are still there and any who will accept, any who will by faith live can receive the hope, the certainty of what lies ahead. In the sermon notes, I gave you three takeaways. Where does your hope for eternity lie? What have you been banking on? Is it what you do or who God is? Do you think we need to do something in order to please God? No. Place faith in Him. And God begins to work through you. That's our hope. What about you? tells others that you're a follower of God. Do you mix in a little too well with the world? That there's really not a difference? Or do you stand apart? Do you stand out? How can God use your life to bring true hope to others? Hammerbergs are heading to the Middle East, Egypt and beyond. Because they see the darkness and they want to be a light. We've already begun looking at our neighborhood and the houses that are going to be around us and the streets that are around us to know that there are dark places that need the light. If you live with the hope of eternity, the hope that is in, found in Jesus Christ alone, you are the light of the world. And as Jesus said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel. But they set it on its stand where it will give light to everyone in the house. You are the hope of the world as Jesus lives his life through you. Will you hide under a bushel or you'll live life on a stand? Let's pray. Father, this morning you have given us hope. You have laid out your hope. Father, I pray for anyone who is, is still in the darkness, whose mind is still confused about what true hope is and that hope can only be found in you and through you. Jesus, would you shed your light as, as we leave this place and go into the world? Would you continue to work on us as individuals? That we would be able to see the darkness. And Father, give us the courage to put our life on a stand where everyone can see that they would know there is true hope in you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Could you all rise with us? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Upon Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Stay on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound. Solid rock 
Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are our hope. Jesus, that you are our hope. Um, we thank you that you have come to this earth and that you you died on the cross for us, God. It was just this, this amazing gift, God. And our hope is just solely on you, God. Thank you. We lift up the rest of this day, the rest of this week, God. Please let, please let us be a light to the rest of the world, God. That they might actually see you and us. Be with us, Lord, and be with those around us, God. It's in your name I pray. Amen. If you need prayer, there will be some people up here up front to pray with you.